Oh, lovely. So um, uh, previously in the bubble, uh, we, we, we introduced the, the general topic of our uh, conversation. And then we, we had a, a week, uh, last week we had a session on, um, on, on, uh, on, on colonial histories and the uses of metaphors and um, the study of, uh, of, 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 of history and the, the, the specifically the history of colonial phenomena. Today we, we are moving on to, to, to the colonial present. Uh, we have three three scheduled papers, and uh, one of them will be will be a pre-recorded um, uh, intervention. Um, and so I'm very very happy to be here. I'm very very happy to 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 see that uh, we have um, 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 you know a committed uh, uh, group of, uh, of of returning uh, uh, scholars uh, wanting probably more. And anyway. That's, uh, that's excellent. And um, we have Sara Maria Sorrentino. She's, um, oh, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to, to hear from uh, uh, three, three scholars. So, Sara Maria. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Sara Maria Sorrentino. I'm an assistant professor in gender and race studies at the University of Alabama. Um, I'm actually gonna be talking about slavery, which I conceptualize as slightly different than colonialism, drawing from um, Afro-pessimist theorization. So I'll be curious to see to what extent that translates to um, Australian audiences and context, and I'll be open for questions about that. Um, but I'm also attempting to think through the contemporary, which is much more difficult for me. Um, so also, curious to see the ways that, that some of these questions potentially translate to contemporary problems. All right, so in this talk, I approach how social thought works to link and de-link black populations from the discourse of disease, focusing on the AIDS crisis as a global problematic whose fraught deployment of what Priscilla Wald calls outbreak narratives prepares the way for contemporary framings of crisis, epidemiological or otherwise. Also, I should have said, someone give me a warning if anything happens in terms of um, uh, connection issues. I don't know what networks look like across, across oceans. Um, so against the pathologizing of black cultural choices, a partial and more recognizable response from the liberal left has been to disaggregate the conjunction of blackness with disease by exposing structural historical conditions of possibility for comorbidity in the black community, this model works to free Black people from biomedical individualism and from the cultural stereotypes that have secured such linkages in the non-Black public imaginary. Here, I want to hesitate, perhaps counterintuitively, to linger over whether the ascendancy of social determinants of health as a structuring frame means that there has been demonstrative progress in relieving Black suffering. I worry elements of the strategy presuppose a definition of race that's determined by the social but not reducible to it. In implying an extra social element to race, this public health strategy runs the risk of conceptually and politically removing race from the condition of its emergence, which I mark here is the violent abstractive forces of slavery that have experimentally deployed blackness as death, disease, virus, risk, and contaminant in the first instance. If race does not precede its cohabitation with slavery's great experiment in human sorting, then a more explanatory starting point might be to identify how blackness has been constructed to be disease as its founding feature in a way that complicates insofar as it might generate what we know as material metaphorical and natural social divides. While the hope of a depathologizing approach is to read black people as more than multivalent vectors of disease and to generate alternative public health responses, I ask whether depathologizing alone can upset the social medical structuring logics that have arrayed vitality and health against death and disease in the global reproduction of anti-blackness. <clears throat> so to encircle this question as a problem of metaphor, I draw from Sidia Hartman's theorization of slaveness as a condition of fungibility in which the captive body is rendered, quote, an abstract and empty vessel vulnerable to the projection of others' feelings, ideas, desires, and values. And I elaborate on my theorizations elsewhere, um, which I've also worked on with Tabji Garba, who I think is here um, in, in an essay that we call Slavery as a Metaphor. Um, um, 
So I'm thinking through the ways that fungibility might mean that blackness is uniquely constructed as a host for metaphorical meaning making. If the structure of slavery makes the world, and this is the speculative hypothesis that I've been trying to work through, then it also makes our relationship to the purported difference between the material and metaphorical. And it does this through the production of a pathological black body that's rendered mute, fleshly, and out of time, that's rendered, in other words, the matter against whether others produce meaning and diagnoses. To address and perhaps anticipate the emergent rhetoric that blackness serves for the present moment, I've found it instructive to return to the early stages of the AIDS crisis, to examine what its off-sited status as the first global pandemic has meant for racial ordering, and to unpack how what the journal Soul's most recent issue calls the 40-year-long black AIDS epidemic, um, and how this is prefig prefigured assumptions of risk and causality, mediated questions of metaphor and materiality, and contoured boundaries of the social to predicate the shape of policing and pathologizing today. So this is all obviously too much to do in a short talk, but I'm interested in sketching out a few maneuvers that I see to be relevant. I close with a call to explore ways that pathological metaphors have been activated for Black revolutionary struggle, how slavery's biological experiment in controlling human reproduction, life, death, and sexuality might be turned against its founding violence as an emancipatory social biological weapon. So to think through AIDS as it was shaped by and shapes the social biological and AIDS as it was shaped by and shapes discourse. Um, and here I bracketed out the debate between Sontag and Tricler because I suspect the other people in future, um, in future sessions are actually going to address this, but I would recommend adding Evelyn Hammond's work to that genealogy. Um, so to enter this question of the relationship between the social biological and discourse um, is to enter the field of the conversation of racism, the pandemic that precedes pandemics as we know them. What Douglas Crimp writes of AIDS, that it does not, quote, exist apart from the practices that conceptualize it, represent it, and respond to it, could also be said of race. And it's not only that race is discursive all the way down, but that it writes its way out of discursivity by producing bodies whose literal reference can conform to the racist figuration. Lee Edelman has more finely detailed how, quote, the most disturbing feature of the Western discourse on AIDS is the way in which the literal is recurrently produced as a figure whose figurality remains strategically occluded, and thus as a figure that can be used to affect the most politically repressive ends, end quote. I argue that by reducing slavery's reduction of blackness to empirical thingliness um, and brute forms of violence means that one of slavery's central products is actually the obfuscation of the role of race in the production and reproduction of the metaphors that shape it, which seems kind of recursive. And I think that that's the problem that needs to be untangled. So although AIDS and its intimate and lingering persistence did not immediately conform to the outbreak narrative popularized in the cultural imaginary, by white lab coats triumphantly containing a spread, its longer history in paradigmatic white gay male victim with access to healthcare and housing was by the mid 1990s able to produce an effective end to the, to the crisis. This end has met the putative containment ah! of AIDS. There's a, an, animal, an animal crisis happening. Um, sorry, the putative, okay, so this, effective end to the crisis has meant the putative containment of AIDS by pharmaceuticals on the one hand and the criminalization of drug use and sex work on the other, which has only engendered the redistribution of crises to the inner city in southern U.S. as well as capturing the continent of Africa as this kind of abstraction for disease. This dynamic, um, I think we could potentially anticipate playing out in years to come um, as the intensification of who and where and how COVID harms, even after it has been medicalized to globally manageable proportions, continues. So we can stay attuned to how, in the mutation of the AIDS crisis, new ways to tether the origins of AIDS to Black pathology emerged. Ways that, as Jared Sexton riffing on Fanon writes, when you say Black, you say AIDS. This formulation, I argue, is not mere metaphor, but the materialization, materialization of metaphor, condensing how metaphors of Black disease become real. Examples of this kind of materialization of metaphor from the AIDS crisis abound. We can see concretely, for example, how the prioritization of public health is a key component of the vision of African anti-colonial projects and the American civil rights movement um, were forcibly rolled back by structural adjustment and neoliberal austerity programs, such that the conditions for an AIDS crisis were optimized. 
much public policy since circulates the assumption that black men don't practice safe sex and as a result are more likely to infect and be infected. This pathogenic construction, which we might call the perversity of the state, helps secure the double bind through which black people are both more vulnerable to the virus and barred from treatment and recognition altogether. And this is especially so for black women and black trans people um, who are then like written out of this scenario, except insofar as they conform to this relationship to death. <clears throat> and this scenario in which the mythos becomes reality was the royal road to criminalization as the anonymous pamphlet, How to Have Sex in a Police State argued in 2015, quote, the risk of being labeled a criminal is now biologically marked. We are infected with criminal potential, end quote. Criminalization as infection also looks like the language by which the virus in Simon Watney's terms can only be understood in the way it eventually kills by transforming all its victims into Africans and threatens to Africanize the entire world. This Africanization logic unsurprisingly is reproduced by animalization logic um, in which Cindy Patton writes, it's far easier to imagine an alternative <coughs> running from monkeys to Africans to queers um, instead of, for example, imagining a political economy of needle sharing and unsafe blood exports to Africa. Extending Adam Geary's proposal that quote, anti-black racism in its concrete historical form has been the matrix through which black people have been made vulnerable to HIV. We can see how the uneven distribution of disease extends beyond the problem of accumulated structures of violence. AIDS has been made instead to replicate and confirm, and confirm the fantasy of its racial origins through the insistence that the point of emergence of the virus should be identified with its cause. The structural answer alone, I argue, does not reckon with how, despite all social scientific and ethnographic evidence to the contrary, black people will still be put in the position of auto-generating their symptom of not only being made to die disproportionately, but of signifying disease as a problem that's decided along the axis of life and death. If AIDS dis discourse is a recent example of blackness perpetuating its original pathology, the exemplary example perhaps is how slavery was made indigenous to Africa, such that black sovereignty becomes a threat to freedom. In this rendering, blackness doesn't just represent vulnerability to slaveness, it collides with slaveness insofar as Africa is abstracted as originally self-enslaving. Because the failure to activate appropriate doses of freedom always targets the ontological, um, a problem in being that precedes both cultural choices and structural causes, the structural strategy, which in the end can only amount to a description of cause and effect and not the condition of possibility for such descriptions, is always doomed to fail. It harbors a secret pathology, the undiagnosable, that returns cause back on its object by accepting the terms of the debate. By accepting, that is, that there is any such thing as a difference between the figural and the literal that blackness wasn't already constructed to mediate. This is perhaps why it is often in the place typically thought reserved for sexually transmitted diseases, where the victim is also considered the agent, that black people are peculiarly only given agency for the destruction that they apparently can't not spread. And you can also see Sadia Hartman's um, analysis of the case of Missouri versus Celia and how Celia was only granted consent in the context of her criminal liability. Um, and so COVID, which I'm only kind of alluding to here, expresses in a different way how all modes of social Congress end up carrying the stain of sexual Congress in a repetition of the prophylactic cycle by which the AIDS crisis actually ended up revitalizing the legacy of anti-miscegenation. And so I'm interested in seeing how, how um, COVID might begin to repeat some of these themes. <clears throat> Perhaps given this complex, the more common rhetorical move of inversion that would render the system pathological, saying, for example, that racism is the disease, um, is not enough. Such a move opens paths for the system to try to heal itself, to repair manifestations of its syndromes, to manage its excesses, and thereby immunize itself from critical intervention. As the impossible object becomes knowable, as the crisis becomes the chronic, assumable, medicalizable, metaphorizable, something slips out of view. Insofar as epidemics demand conditions but are irreducible to them, we might call this something that slips out of view, the problem of blackness. As blackness has functioned in Hartman's fungibility frame is the empty place through which a host of multivalent metaphors can be generated and symptoms can be enjoyed. Epidemic metaphors do not exhaust themselves on their own terms, but spread their demand for containment and control and the anxiety of another epidemic yet to come. 
and policing the possibility that as Du Bois intoned in 1915, the war of the color line will outdo and savage in humanity any war this world has yet seen. And this spirit, the riots and rage erupting in the aftermath of the outbreak of COVID might be considered an expression of what Sexton has called the transvaluation of pathology, where the disease of blackness is assumed and unleashed upon the world to reorient it. Quote, something like an embrace of pathology without pathos. Part of this embrace might involve contesting the monopoly of the essence of vitality and reckoning with those assumed already dead, not as proto-patients in waiting, but as those whose being haunts the life, death, material, metaphorical divides that anti-blackness has been constructed to police. To assume the position of a pathology without pathos is to assume the possibility of something outside the scope of diagnostic meaning making. It is, as AIDS activists and testimonials have shown, to redirect attention to the obscene, its impossible representation, its excess to meaning and organization as a new mode of sociality, one whose curative properties might be found not in medicine or management, but in ending the world as we know it and rewriting its prescriptive gestures anew. Thank you. Hey, Maria, that's, um, that's, um, that's, uh, that's interesting. That's, um, there's so much to, 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 to delve on this. Um, um, and that actually, transfers us collectively to, to a discussion of, of, of the present. So that's, um, that's, uh, that's proce all proceeding according to plan. That's, um, that's wonderful. Okay, now, I'm worried I derailed the plan somehow, so. Right, uh, um, but the plan is always reconstructed ex post, but that's uh, besides the point. Now we, Scott, are you, are you ready to go? I am ready, hello. Sensational, let's go. <laughs> Um, hi, um, yeah, I'm Scott Newman. I'm speaking to you from Melbourne. Um, uh, although in another alternative trajectory, I'd be speaking to you from Los Angeles, where <laughs> I should be starting a postdoc, but um, that's a long story for another time. Um, I'm going to go ahead with my talk, which is titled Decolonizing the Mouth or Listening to Zimbabwean Literature. And this title nods to the Kenyan thinker Ngugi Wationgo's Decolonizing the Mind. Uh, in that book, Ngugi made a case for the importance of writing African literature in African languages. Since cultural subjugation was affected by the imposition of colonial European languages. As he sums it up, the physical violence of the battlefield was followed by the psychological violence of the classroom. Decolonizing the mind is Ngugi's reminder of the imperative that geopolitical independence is, uh, should be accompanied by mental liberation. Likewise, today I'm exploring how fiction writers from Zimbabwe, all of whom read and were implicitly in dialogue with their Kenyan counterpart, engaged in a project I'm dubbing Decolonizing the Mouth. I'll be addressing the recurrence of sonics, sonic, oral, and vocal metaphors in Zimbabwean literature since the 70s. This broad set of literary figures that I'll be discussing extends beyond the category of metaphor to understand the range of symbolic referentiality to mouths, voices, sounds, and speech in Zimbabwe's literary archives. I'll be offering some commentary on one key text, uh, Dambuzo Maricera's 1978 autobiographical novella, The House of Hunger. Um, uh, I will also just briefly allude at the end to a couple of other writers, such as Yvonne Vera, who wrote in the 90s, um, she has a few uh, novels, Under the Tongue and The Stone Virgins, and the contemporary poet Siti Jaji, whose 2019 poetry collection, Mother Tongues, kind of encapsulates this, um, uh, this trend or this, this troping of tongues that I'm trying to excavate here. Uh, and really, I, I want to kind of just amplify some of these material and political significations of the mouth and its associated sonority. Conventional scholarly accounts of voice in African literature point to the influence of orature on written forms like the novel. Orature includes indigenous storytelling, proverbs, song, and other spoken word genres. This is certainly true for many texts written in the mid 20th century, but in more recent decades, voices take on a myriad other meanings. Another factor is this tendency to equate the human voice with political agency. You can hear the troping of vocality in a lot of post-colonial thought. Uh, 
Uh, think of Spivak's essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? A Caution Against Ventriloquizing the Other. Uh, that's just one example of the abiding rhetorical power of idioms like speaking out, silencing, and so on. I want to be cautious when considering the exclusionary assumptions behind finding one's voice and related idioms as proxies for self-realization. I'll come to that a bit later. Post-colonial African writers mobilize metaphors of voice against the literal and symbolic silencing of African subjects in European literature, I guess, and, and beyond literature too. Consider two canonical examples. Shakespeare's The Tempest, a dramatization of the colonial encounter in which racist denigration was rationalized by biased auditory perception. The native islander in that play, Caliban, warns that, quote, the isle is full of noises, sounds, and sweet airs uh, that give delight and hurt not, end quote, uh, they do not heed that warning. Uh, in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the narrator Marlow journeys up the Congo River in search of the rogue agent Kurt, with whose exceptional eloquence he becomes obsessed. All the while, Marlow describes the continent's menacing and inscrutable soundscape filled with the native inhabitants, quote, savage discords, excessive shrieking, wails, yells, cries, howls, weird incantations, strings of amazing words that resemble to no sounds of human language." Uh, end quote. My point here is that the colonial notion of black vocal illegibility ripples across European literature. Zimbabwean writers, as I will now show, challenge conceptions of the African voice as illegible, disabled, or repulsive. Their experiments with the phonic limitations of textuality also challenge the aesthetic terms of expressivity by which African literature is judged. They achieve this by employing a range of figures of sound, including aphasia, the loss of speech, logoria, excessive speech, stuttering, and tripping tongues. Um, now let's turn to Marichard, um, who published his book of short stories, The House of Hunger, in 1978. That's two years before Zimbabwean independence. The Coming of Age Chronicle of Black Life in Rhodesia, with reflections on his studies at a colonial mission school before interrupted stints at university in Salisbury and Oxford. There's an abundance of oral and sonic detail ascribed to all the characters in The House of Hunger. The protagonist's mother has a hoarse bass voice. Her language takes on a, an earthy tone in conversation. His father has a broken, tobacco-stained teeth. At the Colonial Mission High School, his white teacher has a special voice, one especially cultivated for talking to idiots. A bullied classmate is constantly whining, jabbering distractedly like an animal. The bully himself sleep talks fitfully in the dormitory at night. And at Oxford, he describes a fellow black classmate who tried to purge his tongue by improving his English and getting rid of any accent from the speaking of it. In a final exemplary passage, the voice of a casual white racist is deliberately cast as grotesque to underscore the semantic content of his hate speech. Quote, the white old age pensioner's face with a pink mouth embedded in meager strings of pink fat sticking with saliva like stalagmites or stalactites showed an obscene razor tooth wound sputtered with spittle and he mumbled, he proceeds to utter racial slurs. Uh, Mar um, here Marichair metonymically reduces the racist to a face with a fleshy mouth oozing phonic saliva. The list indicates how characterization achieved through vocalization, as well as the importance of the mouth as a locus of violence in Marichair's writing. Now things get interesting when we start to uh, listen to the protagonist's own voice in The House of Hunger. Um, the author, Marichera, had a speech disfluency in real life, and he ensures that his autobiographical counterpart shared this condition manifested in the hallucination of voices, stuttering, aphasia, logoria, and other patterns of broken speech in the text. And immediately, I want to flag this very idea of broken speech, which often was sort of reinforced by Western biomedical knowledge of what constitutes proper speech etiquette. And it's been weaponized to pathologize racial others. For example, the derogatory term Hottentot is derived from the onomatopoeic mockery of stuttering that early Dutch colonists in South Africa thought they heard in the Khoi Khoi language. The protagonist in The House of Hunger is ashamed of his blistered lips, his aching gums, discolored teeth, and the dentures he wears, which he constantly compares to his frenemy Harry's enviable toothpaste character. The obsession with white teeth is suggestive of cultivating a white voice. 
speech to fluency in the book directly alludes to the fact of colonial alienation through language. The protagonist's painful vocal disorientation is rooted in the experience of leaving his mother tongue, Shona, a language indigenous to Zimbabwe, for learning the colonial language and learning in the colonial language. About halfway through the first story in the book, he explains, my voice was breaking and the unusual sound of it made me jump irritably. It seemed to me something was taking over my body, the images and symbols I had for so long taken, I had taken for granted for so long had been taken upon themselves in a strange hue. I was, taken, I was losing my grasp of simple speech. I began to ramble incoherently in a disconnected manner. I was being severed from my own voice. When I talked, it was in the form of an internal argument on the one side of which was always expressed in English and the other in Shona. I felt gagged by this absurd contest, completely muzzled, literally robbed of words. In an interview after this, uh, his publication, Marachera admits that he was, quote, a keen accomplice and student in his own mental colonization. He goes on to explain he took to the English language as a duck takes to water and never considered writing in Shona. The shock of being suddenly struck by stuttering was the undergrowth of my experimental use of English, he explains. Through the agony of stuttering, Emeritus learned to distrust language, a distrust necessary for a writer, especially one writing in a foreign language. So stuttering gave Emeritus this creative spark required to embark on the, this experimental writing career in a colonial language that actively estranged him from his Shona speaking family. I want to be careful in this approach to metaphorical stutters and metaphors of disability. Um, critic Christopher Eagle points out that speech pathologies in modern literature are often, quote, diagnosed metaphorically as a symptom of some character flaw, such as excessive nervousness or weakness, or treated as a symbol of the general tendency of language towards communicative, communicative breakdown or ambiguity and so on. Um, metaphorical stutters are also frequently attributed to male characters as a form of psychosexual blockage. This is the case of the tragic hero of Chinua Achebe's Nigerian novel, Things Fall Apart. In my reading of House of Hunger, stuttering functions more than in the service of characterization. I'd say it positions the voice in proximity to violence. The protagonist div divulges his nightmares of submission to cruel and involuntary treatments for his voice from the mythological and early modern to a more recent American handbook on stuttering. Quote, I dreamt last night that the Prussian surgeon, Johann Friedrich Diefenbach, had decided that I stuttered because my tongue was too large and he cut my large organ down to size by snipping off chunks from the tip and the sides. My tongue was abnormally thick and large and another forced my mouth open and stuck blistering substances to my tongue to drain away the dark fluid. This painful oral mutilation is really suggestive of the fetishization of African anatomy in a colonial pseudoscience of race. It also suggests uh, the entanglement of the, of the senses and perceiving otherness and the way that metaphors of voice aid in writing embodiment. The scene is closely followed by another encounter where Maritara's voice beca uh, comes under scrutiny, this time by a white Rhodesian policeman who stops and searches the teenage protagonist in his township. The policeman harasses the protagonist who is muted in the terror of the moment and by the memory of his father's recent murder by the police. He explains that his overwhelming desire to move his jaws and force his tongue only resulted in uh, his ability to croak out unintelligible sounds. The aphasic episode enrages the policeman who punches him in the face, knocking out his dentures. It is hardly a coincidence that the colonial agent in this scene is the only character granted direct speech in the form of a quickfire inter interrogation. Damn, hey, false teeth too, hey, false identity too, hey. The narrator hopelessly exclaims, I had to speak, but the exclamation only draws attention to his voice's inaudibility in the face of medical pathologization and state regulation. So tongues really have a lot of uh, critical purchase um, symbolically in Zimbabwean literature, and there isn't really time to go into detail about Maritara's successes, as there are uh, quite a large number of authors who share this preoccupation with vocal and sonic metaphors. Yvonne Vera's novels from the 90s and early 2000s vo uh, contain voices that ripple uh, from the past, especially women's voices that would be muted. In her novel, Butterfly Burning, a young woman's desire for autonomy is thematized as a search for a melody of her own. The narrator of um, 
Her novel Under the Tongue takes the form of a dialogue between a girl, Zizia, and her mother, who must teach her to regain speech after she became mute following her rape. And Vera's last novel from 2004, The Stone Virgins, media meditates on the horrific state-sponsored mass killings in the southwest of post-colonial Zimbabwe in the 1980s, an event known as Gukurahundi. The protagonist, Nonseba's lips are mutilated by a drunk soldier, and she is literally silent. In these traumatic scenes, Vera tries to manage unspeakable gendered violence, unspeakable in the sense that they both arrest victim and witness, making them exceedingly difficult to narrate, but also unspeakable in the sense that the discussion of violence against women in a, is taboo in a deeply patriarchal society. Um, and uh, I just want to like gesture to one last very recent text of the composed, contemporary poet Sisi Jaji, whose book Mother Tongues uh, really uh, brings together a lot of these themes uh, to do with uh, the loss of language, inheritance of language, and kinship, especially maternal kinship. And so I hope really today that I've pointed to some of the ways that nonverbal and extra linguistic dimensions of sound uh, that are omitted from the human mouth have been adopted in Zimbabwean writing, and how these sounds metaphorize colonial violence and its post-colonial afterlife. The range of phonic and oral figures I've just pointed to in Marachera's writing in particular extend far beyond uh, mere metaphor of voice. Uh, they're in some, they in some way establish literal and conceptual proximity of voice to violence, especially co colonial violence against the body, which very often determines the conditions of possibility for vocalization. Their voices politicize the sayable by casting doubt on the governability of language in both its phonic and graphic iterations. And they remind me to keep listening to literature. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Scott. Um, that was wonderful. And um, I already found um, a way of coordinating these two papers. Um, 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 so I look forward to, to our discussion. That, um, we will take place um, um, after we we we, are, we listen to 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 Rahul some um, uh, uh, recorded uh, intervention. Carlos, hi everybody, Carlos from IPCS here. So I'm about to put um, Raúl's intervention through, and um, you might notice a slight delay between the video and the sound. Um, this has nothing to do with Raul's presentation, but rather the, the tech setup, but, but it should work. Um, give me a second here. Greetings from Perth. Uh, my name is Dr. Rahul Krishna Garola, and I'm the Krishna Summers Lecturer in English and Postcolonial Literature at Murdoch University in um, Western Australia. The title of my talk today is uh, From Metaphor to Meme, Mamsab Motifs in David Lean's Passage to India and the Internet's Karen Trend. And before I go into my brief presentation, I'd like to earnestly thank everyone at the Institute for Postcolonial Studies in Melbourne for hosting this very innovative and uh, novel way of sharing research across the country and across the world. Um, I'm deeply grateful to the organizers of the Bubble Seminar Series, as well as Alison Kadic and the rest of the staff at the Institute for Postcolonial Studies. So what I'd like to do is begin by sharing the abstract I read and in a more conversational way, just speaking a little bit about why I wrote this abstract and what I was thinking. So in the first half of 2020, the COVID-19 global pandemic has been historically concomitant with some of the most robust and inspiring anti-racist pro anti protests from around the globe. Despite local, state, and federal mandates to maintain social distancing in self-managed bubbles, and I say bubbles in quote marks, that recapitulate 
uh, heteronormative ideals of home, family, community, and nation, a diverse cohort of peoples worldwide have taken to the streets in a radical redefining of family. But we still witness exponential murders of Black Americans, and not just Black Americans, but Black Australians as well, upon whose ancestors' bloodied hands and scarred backs the USA has been built upon, and whom police officers' gun barrels are routinely aimed at. Indeed, as inspiring as Black and Brown people with white allies demonstrating the streets has been, we have concurrently witnessed horrific xenophobic and racist responses to the stark visibility of colored bodies in public space. And I would just say briefly, since 9-11 uh, was right around the corner, we've also seen this kind of codification of black and brown bodies and the violence that they've been subjected to in uh, migratory spaces, diasporic spaces, at borders, in airport spaces, under the sign of terrorism or and or Muslim. One of the most disturbing of such instances occurred on May 25th, 2020, when a white woman named Amy Cooper, who was working as a CEO in a lofty Lower Manhattan Invest firm in New York City, threatened to call the New York Police Department on an African-American bird watcher named Christian Cooper. Uh, these two Coopers have no relation to each other. In this disturbing social transaction that went down in Central Park, Mr. Cooper, the bird watcher, captured video footage of Mrs. Cooper weaponizing the New York Police Department against him by feigning an assault, going to such lengths as to raise her voice in a panicked hysteria about the, quote, African-American male, unquote, while yanking her dog's leash so hard and high that the helpless canine appeared to be choking. Um, this is all on video and you can view it on YouTube or any number of you, uh, uh, news sources. While Mr. Cooper was spared violence uh, from the police department and his life, on the very same day, Minneapolis police officer Derek Chavon thrust his knee into George Floyd's neck for almost nine minutes despite the latter's gasping cries, screaming, quote, I can't breathe, unquote. One black man's life from the NYPD, who, let me remind everyone, in 2014, choked to death Eric Garner in Staten Island, whose dying cries were also, I can't breathe. While one black man's life from the NYPD was saved due to his own quick thinking, while another was murdered by police thousands of miles away in Minnesota, these viscerally disturbing images of anti-Black policing around the world compel today's social justice activism to not only tackle anti-Black, anti-Brown, and anti-Yellow racism, and the anti-Yellow racism is, of course, a reference to the anti-Asian racism that has exploded around the whole world since February of this year, with the COVID-19 global pandemic. Um, while we must um, think about social justice activism to not only tackle anti-Black, anti-Brown, and anti-Yellow racism head on, we must moreover deploy intersectional approaches to critiquing the colonialist, heteronormative white privilege that some women have violently conjured to portray themselves as milky damsels in distress. A timely and urgent question here arises that critically interrogates gendered white privilege that banks on heteronormative violence and black stereotypes. And the question is the following. What is the history of this faux invocation of genocidal policing by some racist white women as a means for putting men of color in harms and perhaps even deaths macabre path. Now, in um, answering this question and to meditate on it, I briefly compare the Mamsab figure in David Lean's much celebrated filmic rendition of Ian e. Forster's 1924 novel, A Passage to India. Lean's film 
secured much praise around the globe and was widely hailed as a merchant ivory style epic in British India that portrays the probable rape of a woman named Miss Adela Quested by the young and charismatic Dr. Aziz. After brief, briefly examining a couple of scenes from Lean's 1984 film that I believe offer us a historical view of the British colonial context in India through the lens of the man sub figure, I then jump to our current moment and examine the evolution of that figure into the modern day meme of the so-called Karen. So if you haven't uh, heard of this particular uh, meme, it's a meme of a so-called white woman who wants to um, invoke the, the manager and basically weaponize um, racialized privilege against men of color and women of color. So there've been a lot of memes across the internet depicting this particular figure. It's an understatement to say that um, in some of these instances, uh, they underscore sexism and misogyny in ways that we must critically interrogate. However, my goal is to think about the ways in which the particular mentality of the so-called Mamseb from colonial days from the British Empire may or may not articulate into this particular figure that wants to weaponize managerial and authoritative power against uh, men of color, and people of color, and also queer, queer men of color. So what I do is I briefly examine a couple of scenes from David Lean's 1984 film that I believe, or more accurately critically analyze, as offering us a historical view of the British colonial context in India through the lens of the Mamsab figure. And I believe that this particular meme has exponentially trended in 2020 and has evolved from the 2018 internet meme of the so-called Barbecue Becky. Uh, and this is a particular figure of a white woman who threatens to call police on black people for barbecuing in public parks. These memes in the digital milieu are intended to call out the ways in which some bourgeois women weaponize white privilege and gender to make claims against black and brown men that invoke the most reprehensible stereotypes. And um, I would just say that these are stereotypes that are very familiar. They're stereotypes that range from the colonialist missions of the white man's burden and the civilizing missions of um, Krishnani um, projects to um, uplift and civilize so-called uh, brown and black people to the ways in which the emancipation of black slaves in the United States led to a frenzy of lynching and um, accusations that are crystallized in um, popular culture throughout the United States um, of black men being uh, rapists that are sexually interested in uh, assaulting white women. So, we know that there's a repertoire of this, whether we're looking at the colonialist um, stereotypes or those in the United States. And of course, uh, one, of the most, um, one of the most disturbing depictions of this is the uh, Griffith film, Birth of a Nation, when we talk about the context of the United States. Context of the United States is really very important right now because of the um, current election that's coming up in November because of the fact that we have, for the first time ever in American history, a biracial woman running on a ticket as vice president with uh, uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, is um, biracial in the sense that her father is Jamaican and her mother is Indian. So this is a truly historic moment for us to think about not just the ways in which biracial and women of color are gendered in the United States, but the ways in which those gender roles might impact, inflect, and even magnify the rampant sexuality that has been portrayed since the uh, mid to late 1800s of black and brown men. Such caricatures enfold the alarming adjectives of the so-called savage, loud, aggressive, disrespectful, insubordinate, and violent 
black and or brown man. So therefore, uh, this presentation thus attempts to trace the historical evolution of the Mamsab psyche from filmic metaphor in David Lean's Passage to India to the Karen meme that has been so popular over the past five, six months on the internet across social media. As such, I hope to provoke a critical reflexive dialogue wherein we can all critically meditate and even partially trace the visual history of settler colonial privilege to class privilege that is weaponized by some white women against black and brown men. Lives that indeed matter, but that are disproportionately incarcerated, exposed to physical violence, and or gunned down in the middle of our streets. Indeed, in Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak's formulation, in the pioneering essay titled, Can the Subaltern Speak? Spivak describes the phenomena as what she calls epistemic violence. My talk then seeks to trace epistemic violence ensconced in the mem sub motif from its filmic metaphor in A Passage to India to its specter in the trending internet meme of Karen, which is also, as I previously said, a uh, problematic caricature. Thank you. I look forward to speaking to you more on this topic. Okay, so that that's brilliant. We have um, we have about forty minutes to 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 to, to enjoy in, to treat each other in conversation. Um, so. Um, I would like to to open the e floor um, and see who, you know, if how we go. Um. As we're waiting for questions, did did Rahul say that he he'd be joining us? At a yes, yes. Um, he is um, working for a living. Uh, Why? Yeah, I know, crazy. Um, so, uh, but, um, but 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 yes, we are hoping that it could um, it could join us, and um, it, it would be so much better to to be able to rely on on his presence rather than um, um, talk about um, what he says, which is also very interesting, but um, would be second best. Um, as also as we wait for for more questions, perhaps um, um, as um. You, Sarah Maria, you 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 began by 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 bracketing um, slavery out of um, of colonialism. You said I, I don't talk about colonialism. Slavery is a different thing, and um, and that's um, entirely legitimate. Of course, it's not. Um, but um, perhaps you 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 want to to expand a bit on um, on how the two articulate relative to each other in, in a way that would probably be productive. Yeah, sure. Um, so actually the main uh, versions of totality, and these are obviously like speculative versions of totality that throw themselves up in order to, to say what their limit are. Um, but the two that I usually differentiate between or that I've been trying to differentiate between are slavery and capitalism. Um, and I, I generally find that most attempts to talk about race um, end up being attempts to talk about race that presume that capitalism is the totality um, and capitalism signals a problem of political economy um, and it signals a problem of materiality that comes from a particular reductive reading of Marx, um, depending on what kind of Marxist you are. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in repositioning the frame as a, as a problem of slavery to think through libidinal economy and its relationship to political economy. Um, and I'm interested in drawing from Afro-pessimist theorizing that looks at how um, in the transition from political theological concepts, blackness occupied the space that um, was previously occupied by questions of evil and questions of the afterlife. And so the kind of place of nothingness um, and so I think that it's productive to look at ways that slavery generates um, conceptual resources for us and generates 
generates actually what we think of as like a distinction between the material and the ideal or um, the political economic and the libidinal economic. And again, those are heuristics, but I'm interested in how um, they seem to be real or how they've come to be conceptualized as real and legitimate distinctions or how we operate um, using them as different distinctions. And I think that there's something about the way that blackness functions in the libidinal economy by um, kind of being assigned to a problem of force and a problem of matter um, that actually is, is yeah, that allows a different way to begin to approach questions of violence and questions of totality. Um, and so in, in my work, I also look at how um, colonialism, slavery, and capitalism tend to be set up in a kind of triad and that typically both colonialism and slavery collapse into this problem of capitalism, even though you can look at, right, historically the conditions that might, we might have had slavery in whatever date you decide that slavery like emerged as a global system, whether it's um, the 1200s, whether it's 1441, whether it's post 1492. Um, but I'm interested in conceptually what happens if you kind of flip the frame of some of the common modes of phrasing that would tie questions of violence to um, land in particular and to uh, kind of material questions of labor in particular. And I think that if we begin with slavery as a, as a conceptual problem or resource for thinking about violence and thinking about what might be needed to challenge, um, to challenge systems of violence, I find that thinking through the problem of slavery and anti-blackness enables a different, a different way of understanding the production of the distinction between the literal and, and metaphoric. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm saying I'm interested in how those things are produced and I'm interested in what conceptual resources we have available to think about and think through that production. So yeah, potentially, um, uh, in, in the material world, these things are all entangled, but what happens if you kind of shift the paradigm for, for thinking about diagnosing what the problem is and diagnosing how to potentially change or solve the problem, if that's what you're looking to do. But I can clarify um, <laughs> those much more. No, that's entirely um, uh, convincing. I, I, I was um, interested in, um, in, in, in what would you, um, how you would um, sort of expand on that uh, statement. Do we have any questions? Um, I, I don't want to hog the conversation, but um, um, I would like to, to... Melinda, to let me come in. Ah, great. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks very much. Oops, let me turn on my video. Um, Thanks very much. Really terrific, very, very rich papers and um, lots of potential um, lines of discussion here. Um, Scott, I think I was really interested in your attention to, um, to language and the loss of language as, um, if you like, the ground for the loss of the making of metaphors that make the world whole for people. and. Um, I'd love to hear you talk to that a little bit. I mean, one of the, the lines of discussion that's been building across the last few weeks is this question of what our attention to metaphors allows us to do. And, and both of you, Sarah Maria and, and Scott, have given us um, extraordinarily potent um, uh, senses of the work that metaphors do in the world within the terms in which they're deployed. Um, but, but I'm interested in, in the possibilities or lack thereof um, that can be done at the interface of metaphors for the breaking of the relationships that are reproduced and reproduced and reproduced. So uh, I might pose, it's almost a question that goes in slightly different directions to both of you. So to Scott, this this challenge of the loss of metaphor making as its own, you know, profound, um, a form of colonizing activity with profound implications for a people's being in the world. But then to Sarah Maria, 
the possibility of cracking the colonial frame in which we have either um, dehumanising um, metaphors or metaphors that we're producing ourselves to humanise ourselves. So there's the bifurcation at work in yours and, and, and with Scott, this, this sense of um, the, the, the intimacy and the significance of metaphoric work within a, a, a local community, if you like. I'm not putting it very articulately, but you're both nodding a bit, so I think perhaps you've got a sense of where I'm coming from. That, that's excellent. Who wants to go first? I'll let Scott go first because I have a, a question on that question, perhaps. So depending on how you answer it, I might piggyback on Melinda's question to help clarify my own in this sneaky maneuver. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Melinda. Um, I think I would just say that um, maybe there's two kinds of loss of language at play in the, in the writers that I'm concerned with, particularly Myra Chera, because um, we're talking about um, his uh, alienation from uh, from his from his mother tongue or native language, as you were, um, into English, and then also the loss of language in general, uh, and both of those he states are generative of uh, a literary language. So the loss of being able to, to, uh, to the loss of kind of spoken language, both the, the indigenous language Shona and language in general, give him um, the kind of tools of creativity for, for literary writing. Um, and of course, for for the invention of metaphors, um, and the, there's one that uh, he returns to uh, um, quite often, and that I uh, didn't get to really cite in my talk. But he talks about uh, lighting gas ovens of limitless black resonance, um, which really is uh, an astounding kind of idea to think about how uh, he's trying to fire up. Um, a kind of uh, vibrational sonic, uh, or it's, it's something that is audible but is not linguistic. You know, so he's he's trying to think about um, he's trying to provide um, audible, like uh, sonic or audible metaphors that 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 are dissociated from spoken language, which is uh, something that he struggles with a lot. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Sarah Maria. Yeah, so I guess to, to return to my, <laughs> my line that slavery might be, might be a useful place to think conceptually, um, one, of, one of the differences between uh, Afro-pessimism as like a theorizing frame and decolonial frames is that um, Afro-pessimism would say that the problem, the problem of blackness is that there's the loss of anything to lose at all. So it's not, it's not that you have a plentitude of language and then that language is lost, but it's actually a kind of disorientation in which there isn't anything prior to claim at all. Um, slavery severs, um, slavers, severs former slaves from the capacity to claim any language that, um, that has like a recognizable trajectory. And so it deranges this question of, or this relationship between plentitude and loss. And it makes, it makes of speech kind of a total a total occupation where there isn't there isn't anything to claim outside of that grammar and so the grammar itself um, is is totalizing if we accept that the world that the world is totalizing um, and so I think that that makes makes the question of violence a lot more violent because there's no there's no way out internal to that grammar and it also means um, that so there's another phrase, the, the ruse of analogy, that gets kind of thrown around in tunnel to um, Afro-pessimism, which is to say that slavery always becomes analogized to something else. Um, and a lot of people hear that or understand the, the question of the ruse as, um, well, there must be like something real about slavery at the end of this analogical procedure that we need to like reclaim and, and hold as precious. Um, and I've been, thinking through how the ruse is that there actually like isn't anything behind it. If slavery was produced out of this total dereliction where there's the loss of anything to, to claim at all, um, then it would be a metaphor all the way down. It would be a problem of language and grammar all the way down. 
um, which I think actually opens up like an entire an entire world, right? Because any any way that you attempt to think um, kind of the gaps in grammar, the the stuttering, which I think was quite useful. And Scott, I'd be interested potentially as a this is the piggyback question: what the relationship between um, like vocalization as capacity and like being is or the relationship between questions of like being and ontology and questions and questions of speech or what that signals um so i think if the if the problem is that there is slavery produces this idea that we have these like literal forms which are black suffering bodies but that that's part of the the figuration that it produces um and there's violence all the way down violence in every kind of form of conceptual grammar and slavery is is only a metaphor because slavery produces both metaphor and materiality. Then I actually think that metaphors can be generative because there isn't there isn't another option available. There's not like an authentic language to claim or a kind of plentitude of meaning um, outside of operations of violence that need to be accessed. That the the kind of violent spoken word itself can um, be reconfigured and retooled um, potentially. Right. Um. I think that these, these three papers um, have offered us um, three examples of um, how metaphors could be mobilized uh, and other rhetorical figures could be mobilized for decolonial purposes. So for example, where if, if we understand and it becomes very compelling that um, blackness is construed as, as disease, then um, staying within the metaphor, the, the prospect is that of depathologizing, right? So, you, you, you use a metaphor and jujitsu like you use it to, to, for the colonial purposes. And that's, uh, that's one way. Um, in the case of Scott's paper, one of his sources was talking um, about um, 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 uh, uh, feeling uh, severed from, 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 from his own voice, from, right? Um, and uh, this, if I recall correctly, is a synesthesia. So, um, it's a rhetorical figure and, and, and it is able to capture um, what colonialism does. It's colonialism, um, sort of the trope of, of the colonized who is unable to articulate. It's got a broken language or has got an indigenous language that is not even comprehensible. It's, uh, it's almost inhuman. Um, this is the classic case of the koi koi's. And, uh, and so, so the synesthesia is actually able to, to, to describe what colonialism does and, and, and therefore produces a critique of, of that. And then uh, Ra Ra Rahul was, was talking about the ways in which um, 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 a metonymy, so the part for the trope, the, 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 the fetish, the colonial fetish about um, a male black sexuality, sexuality, is weaponized, which is which is a, which is a, you know the, the weaponization. It describes a process, but it's also a metaphor, right? So um, uh, so again, we have an example of how um, you, you know you, metaphor enables you to to capture colonialism in action and to disarticulate the way it works. Um, so this is one way we can put these three papers together and as as examples of. Uh, of how attention to metaphor can um, result in, um, in, 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 in decolonial um, um, openings. And I'd say respect to, with respect to kind of what I was talking about, maybe a clearer way to say it would be that um, if we don't attend to metaphor, then we actually can't address the problem because we end up just just addressing kind of logical and rational um, things in the world instead of the ways that that particular relationships to language and desire and fantasy attach to the black body that actually inhibit being able to solve the thing that people say that they want to solve. So it's actually attention to metaphor that provides attention to um, some of the the ways that the system of anti blackness as far as I can tell as, as far as I articulate it, is able to, to reproduce itself. So I think that it's attention to metaphor and then potentially mobilization of metaphor um, that, can, that can expose some of those libidinal procedures or procedures of, of fantasy and its relationship to language in ways that it tending to um, something, something like base materialism, although I don't really believe that that exists, um, kind of directs our attention away from some of those dynamics.
Right. Des? Yeah. Um, so I, I just had, I had a question and, and a thought, I, I suppose. The, so the question um, to, to Scott, I, I was very interested in, in uh, Scott's paper. And I, Scott, um, you cover a lot of historical ground in, in your examples. You go back to um, novels in the 70s through to very modern novels. And obviously you're covering a lot of, as I said, there's a lot of historical political change in Rhodesia and Zimbabwe over that period of time. And I wonder um, how or to what extent you think that the metaphorical ideas about voice and, and mouth and so on, um, do you think about how those things have changed under the pressure of a changing politics? How are those have developed or transformed? And I guess in some ways I'm thinking um, about Tsitsi Dangaremga, um, who's right, just been nominated for the Booker Prize and mm -hmm. just been arrested by the Zimbabwe government for her political voice. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess I'm interested in the way in which changing political context puts pressure or changes the kind of metaphorical ways in which this imagery is, is used. Um, thanks, Desmond. A brilliant question. I'd love to come back at some point to uh, Lorenzo's point about synesthesia because that really put it, uh, you really put your finger on something um, uh, helpful there. Um, so, yes, um, Desmond, uh, to your uh, excellent question about, <laughs> you know, these, I'm talking about kind of like 40, uh, 40 years of uh, in which um, uh, um, the meanings attributed to the voice have, have shifted remarkably, as you as you have pointed out, obviously. And I, I think that um, we've seen kind of a return in more recent uh, literature to a kind of uh, nativist valuing of uh, orality, of, of indigenous orality, that around Tamaritara's time in the 70s and 80s, around, um, you know, it, around, in Zimbabwean independence in 1980, and in the wake of that, there was um, there was a there was a turn to more um, experimental modes of voicing, and that that's really what Marichera uh, embodied, as far as I can understand. Um, but more recently, there's been a, a curious turn back to more uh, to kind of real realist modes uh, of writing, uh, I believe, uh, that were more. Uh, common in sort of like the 50s and 60s during the colonial period proper. And um, I'm not really sure what to make of that, the kind of the, uh, the, the kind of revaluing of, um, uh, of, of like of oral genres and in particular. So the voices, you know, where you often have like the recurrence of um, uh, an elder storyteller in the story who might be the narrator or might be a, a central kind of uh, moral uh, pivot in the no in a novel uh, or um, who might be kind of like a um, an oral chorus that returns as, a, as like again like an, uh, like a moral guiding uh, point in the novel so um, th there has been a significant change I think but you know I've, I've only really been able to focus on Marichera who who did break from that tradition significantly in 1978, when he published The House of Hunger. Um, I hope that makes sense. Could I pull right. a speculative question to Rahul that then maybe we could answer collectively in some way? Is that in his absence? Or that is generated? No, no, good idea. Okay. Um, so I, I've done some research and writing on the, the historiography of the slave mistress. Um, and there's been, there's been some recent work, um, Tavolia Glimpse out of the House of Bondage and Stephanie Joan Rogers is, um, They Were Her Property, which just came out last year. Um, and, bo and both of those texts are interested in seeing ways that, that the slave mistress um, and the, the ways that the slave mistress was essentially just as powerful as the master in terms of um, access to different resources on the plantation, um, that slaves were like the way that the mistress was able to um, have inheritance on the plantation, not through land, um, and that 
slave mistresses um, in, in many historiographical um, cases were just as, if not more violent than, than the master and that most of that has been obscure in historiography. Um, and I've been interested in ways that people have been attempting to then say, okay, then the structure of the slave mistress is the same as the structure of the slave master. They're both structures of, of violence that reproduce slavery. Um, so thinking that historiographical maneuver in conversation with um, different black feminists who have, who have said that slavery also reproduces um, different conceptions of gender and um, conceptions of sexuation that would have it so that the slave mistress's mode of violence actually can't be revealed. So that there's, there's this like interesting difficulty where you can, um, you can begin to identify ways that slave, slave mistresses um, are violent, but actually that historiographical methods in terms of um, like what's available and what can be traced don't want that to be seen. And so there's a difficulty in saying that there's an equivalence of violence when that disequivalence is actually what produces particular conceptions of um, gender or gender as whiteness by producing like white women as being more vulnerable and only being enraged when supposedly threatened. And I think that that actually is pretty central to how gender gets reproduced in a way that it would be, it would be pretty difficult to say that they're actually the same structure of violence, that the difference in their structure of violence is actually important because it creates this difference in gender that then is used to, to police blackness. Um, and I was wondering what he might think of that um, question that I have, the relationship between this historiography of slavery that tries to incorporate slave mistresses violence and then black feminist theorizations that say that actually um, that, that difference in gender and that difference in violence is actually productive to give white women more power because they get to say, oh, I'm vulnerable at some moments and then I'm allowed to be enraged in others. And that, that actually is central to this generic conception of gender. And it seems that there's this tension between um, this theory and this historiography. And I was wondering in what ways that might translate to the question of the Mem Sahib and to the Indian colonial context um, in terms of his talk and the way that he's tracing that context to the, the Karen figure. I don't know if that makes, makes sense as a, as a question, but it's something I, I know I've been trying to work through and I'd be curious to hear how people um, make sense of that problem, but also kind of registering moving from the the plantation and the American and Caribbean context and um, colonial context in India and elsewhere. Well, there, there is a there, there is a substantial um, uh, literature in on Australia about um, relationships between white women and um, Aboriginal people. So. Um, that's, that tension is um, is um, operative here also. Right? There's there's no doubt about it. Um, but is the tension one that then the reveal the moment of reveal is okay now we know that white women are just as violent as white men or is the tension of okay the reason it's been so difficult to realize that is actually because the way that gender is structured makes it almost prohibitive to recognize that, that we have to start to challenge or question the structure of, of gender difference in order to access the particular ways that white women are violent. Because I guess that's the thing I, I struggle with is there's, a, there's almost like a neutralization of gender difference, right? When you say that white women are just as violent as white men, when actually that violence is in some, or the difference between that violence is in some way what, what generates gender difference and what has protected white women from, um, from being called out for so long, at least publicly. I mean, I, I think that, that um, Sarah, you, you draw attention to the fact that that metaphor or that trope, you know, it, it's a complicated trope and it's internally riven between its kind of desire for critique and it's falling back on a male privilege that feels entirely entitled to critique the privilege of white women and is almost always silent about the critique of the privilege of white men. So that the, the way in which it singles out um, women as the subject of this critique or the subject of satire is, I mean, and, and Raoul acknowledges this, highly problematic, right? And so do we, do we read this symbol, do we read this trope as a way of calling out white privilege or as a highly selective way of calling out certain kinds of white privilege, um, which are vulnerable to that critique in the ways in which 
um, the privilege of white men is often, you know, not vulnerable and is not called out uh, in that kind of way. And, and I think to try and work out what this figure, whether we're talking about the, the meme, the, the Karen meme, or if we go back to the, the, the trope of the Mem Sahib in, in 19th century colonial literature, to try and work out what it's actually pointing to and how, how it operates or doesn't operate, um, we would have to get closer to the texts that we're interested in. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm wondering whether, um, you know, I was, I was thinking about this in relation to Rao's paper, is what work is the reference to the passage of India really doing here? How is it helping us understand um, this meme? Um, or is it simply just a reference to a continuity or a correlation? And, and I think if it's actually going to do work, um, it would be good to know much more about the text that we're talking about, either the Forster <clears throat> novel or the lean film, and to, 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 to perhaps if we were looking really closely at the ways in which those figures are rep represented um, in those works, we might, get, we, might, we might get closer to what is at stake in the ways in which they're being played with in the 20th century or 21st century. We definitely need Rahul here. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it does come down to just a question about whether he has really problematized enough or thought through what it means to problematize or to acknowledge the problematization of um, the use of white women as symbols for illegitimate um, patriarchal power or, or, or white power. Um, and, and I think that, yeah, as I said, I, I think that you can acknowledge it, but, but, but it would be better to do more than just acknowledge it and actually work with those, that critique to try and get closer into the fabric um, of the metaphor and understand, as I said, exactly how it's working or not working, what kinds of privilege it's willing to, to stand against and what kinds of privilege it's absolutely not willing to stand against. Great. So we need more than a passage to a passage in India. Yeah, yeah, we need more than a passage. Yeah, we... Okay. Christine, I, 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 um, would you like to intervene at this point? I'd, it was just an aside. Uh, I was really taken by um, the new historiography. We are looking at female um, prisoners of uh, um, concentration camp inmates, but we are also looking at women, Nazi women as perpetrators. And uh, what we get is actually a complete different chronology of, of violence, how it's inflicted, sexualized violence, motivations. Um, the women who perpetrate violence are younger than the men. They come through Weimar. Uh, they understand themselves as women in aprons like me at the moment. Uh, but, uh, but they are... Um... So anyway, the lessons out of it is that actually uh, what our colleague just said, that when we look at um, women perpetrators or the white women or the Aryan women, uh, we really get a gendered, uh, a difference uh, of, of perpetration and the... Um, Nazi war crimes trials ever had any women in because there was this idea that uh, women are the better world and the Frauen couldn't have done it so they just walked uh, uh, free anyway but that's the history of the trials. Yay. Great. Well, mm. that's great. That's... So sorry, it's not colonialism. Can, it's can, just Nazis. <laughs> Yay. Can I ask a question as well? Of course. I, 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 I saw you turned on the camera. I knew you would be. Um. <laughs> no, I've, look, I've really enjoyed all of the papers. I nodded along with, with all of them. I think they're all true. They're all correct, especially in addition to each other. I mean, the, the pathology of blackness, I mean, that's, that's, that's um, really, really you know, striking. And, and, and the point was well made. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, because you know, the question was, was how language connects the colonial past to, to present. And I was thinking, you know, listening to, to, to Scott's paper, also how it can connect this colonial center to the periphery. So the, the metropolis to the colonial, to the colonial center. Because I too, like, like Ngugi or Ngohe or Diongo, I, I, I'm a Kenyan uh, academic teaching, teaching overseas. And, and, but unlike Ngugi, 
I, I don't speak uh, Gekoyo. I don't really, I don't understand. I don't understand. I, I wouldn't be able to hold a conversation um, in, in the language. And of course, he, I mean, if you're going to, to talk about his discipline, his discipline would be English literature. And then, of course, after he got a job in the English literature department, he, he did his best to, to abolish it. And, and, and look, there's, there's a point here that I'm trying to make, which is that Ngugi wa Thiongo clearly is safer. I'm not going to say more comfortable. I'm just going to say safer, uh, as it were, in, in, in the belly of the beast, where... <laughs> where of course, he, he doesn't teach in in, in Gekoyo, uh, and 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 that kind of thing. So, in a sense, it's it's it's. it's, it's it, I think I'm tagging along uh, Desmond's question around the, the the change over time, but also not not just time. The change the change in space. So where where you can critique, who you can critique, who are you actually critiquing, and 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 this is it, the core of, of of my question is 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 actually what Sarah Maria. Uh, sort of talked about with regard to to gender, it's it's with Ngugi wa Thiong, it's regard to class. How class disappears um, when when you talk about decoloniality in, in terms of languages and then in terms of speak your own languages. So speak Gekoyo, you, you it, it it obscures the fact that he's a class warrior, that he's a Marxist, um, and instead it becomes this other. It presents very differently if you are in Kenya, a community of 42 different tribes, and you're only bound together. The demos is only bound together by a post-colonial state that nobody, that nobody chose, nobody ever consented to. It's just a fact of life. So the, the common language um, would be English and, and Swahili. So none of the actual uh, sort, of, sort of local ones. And the people that, that say would speak only Kikuyu would not have the access uh, that Ngogi Watyongo has, the authority, the, uh, I don't want to use the word, but the privilege, the privilege of speaking English. It is a privilege. Um, it, it, it's, it's definitely um, uh, a privilege in, in, in that sense, because we wouldn't know Ngogi Watyongo if he spoke no English. Before Scott answers, maybe as a, as a, this is just an anecdote, but Ngugi was my professor at UC Irvine and um, he, he was in a hotel in Southern California waiting in the lobby and was um, escorted out because they believed that he wasn't supposed to be at that hotel. And that was before he said any word at all, right? He's a distinguished um, professor. He's been up for the Nobel Peace Prize, um, and so he, he might be more safe, right? But there is a way that he's that he's policed in in the belly of the beast, regardless of of what he says. His speech actually, like in some ways, doesn't doesn't signify anything at all. Um, his, his very presence in that hotel was seen to be a threat, um, and it, it made it made some national news. Although then later, obviously, he went to Kenya and he was. Um, kidnapped, so so there are different. Exactly, forms. he had a much worse experience in a hotel in Kenya than he did in 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 in, in you know in the U.S. Mm. It's kind of a framing of of speech and and how speech signifies in different. Contexts. I wonder what kind of language um, um, was used during the kidnapping. It's, it's Kenya. So Obviously, it was kicked out of the hotel in. <laughs> California, they, uh, in English, possibly. Yeah, they, they, he was in English <laughs> in California and kidnapped in, in probably Kikuyu in Kenya. Um, uh, I, I would just uh, <laughs> um, uh, hazard a guess that, um, uh, well, not a guess, but just remind that uh, Ngugi is uh, you know, a major champion of, of translation, so not, not only of uh, um, uh, does he, you know, is he a champion of minority languages like Kukuyu, both in Kenya and internationally? You know, I think his, his project is very much one of not just writing in Kukuyu and only being in a blinkered kind of Kukuyu uh, life world, but very, like translating that into other languages. I think he's, it, at least from what I understand, he's concerned with beginning in Kukuyu and then translating uh, 
um, outward, and that that seems to be something to uh, something important to underline, um, as it often gets left out in uh, um, readings of his of you know of important things that he signed on to, like the abolition of the English department. That you're okay. um, um, also, we should say that um, translation has a as a as a as a long, long uh, uh, anti-colonial pedigree, right? Um, as a as an act of uh, anti-colonial insurgency. So mm. that's excellent. Now, but um, of that of that, like uh, Ngugi doesn't get to teach in Kikuyu. He doesn't get to to teach translation pedagogically, also, and so. There are some things that you can do in your writing that in other other ways that you inhabit the world and and he he still teaches classes, which is amazing. He teaches like a regular kind of um, routine of classes and he he teaches English um, and in some ways rails against that as a violation that is imposed on him by by the context in which he lives so All right yeah, there's attention there so I, I want to thank you. Oh, and um, and this 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 one was wonderful. I I believe we have run out of time. Carlos, okay, isn't that yeah. so? And um, <laughs> yes. I, and um, uh, well, I, I really hope to 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 see you all um, next week. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Really Thank you all. Thank you all. People from all over the place coming in. Fantastic. Thank you, Be well. Thank you, Melinda. Bye.